this is the zone order of a, a downdraft gasifier, drying pyrolysis combustion reduction. We've separated the gas, um, you know, the, the, the gaseous flow from the solids flow, and we're gonna and what we're gonna see going through here is how, what you want to be doing with the gas and solids outputs of each of these sta stages are different. So putting one process next to another and taking both the gas and the solid to the next process um, is non-ideal in many cases, okay? And you end up wanting this very com complicated redirect issue. So let's say we take biomass into this first block here. We apply some heat in some manner. What comes out of that is two things, dry biomass and water vapor. The dry biomass we want to use in, in pyrolysis, so it can go direct there. But the water vapor, in principle, isn't helping us at all in pyrolysis, and we don't want it in combustion because it's, it's, it's taking our heat away. We actually don't want to be combusting the char because we already have a, a deficit of it. We already have way too much tar gas to char, so we don't really want that tar gas passing, or excuse me, the char passing down through the hearth and burning. We'd rather take it all the way around, um, which is not what a downdraft gas fire do, does. We'd rather the char go all the way around the reduction and the tar gas mix with air and burn in combustion, but only have the tar gas being burned in combustion. Okay? And then at the final state, combine these um, um, products of combustion, the heat, the char, and reduction, and have it come out your end thing. Okay? Now you see that was nothing like a downdraft gasifier. But this is the fun of reactor design, because you can start moving things around to better approximate this. So that's the chemical part that you'd ideally like to have. The problem is that chemical part and the thermal part are completely unrelated to how fuel likes to move through the world. How fuel likes to move through the world is to not have a world to move through. It likes to just fall without being in the presence of any other vessel, uh, without being moved upward, uh, without binding and bridges and small, small um, orifices for. Um, it likes to not be interactive with, okay? Uh, it wants to um, go down um, as much as possible without us. And so I don't really know how to represent that, so it, it's, it's kind of, there's nothing here other than man falling in this. It just wants to participate in gravity without any other um, impacts. So uh, as you start trying to make those thermal or those chemical relationships work better, you end up in all of these redirects and things going where they don't really want to go, and augers and lifts, and um, you know, and soon you have this big plant of a Goldberg machine trying to set up those relationships correctly. Okay. So the chemical part gets even more complicated because, again, each of these things here that I said, well, where do you want, where do you want these outputs to go? Well, things. It's not actually as simple as you really don't want to use the, the water in pyrolysis or in combustion, or also in cracking here. Water vapor at temperature as steam is, is a catalyst for tar cracking. So it can be relevant to bring your, your, um, your steam into the cracking stage here, okay? If you have adequate temperature. Um, so what I want to do now, very quickly, is go through these different processes and show some of the variation you're dealing with. Um, which is the fourth ring of why this is a diff difficult though interesting problem to solve. Um, so what I call this is gasification is in the ring for all variables all the time. Um, which is why we all suffer so much. From the okay, the simplest one, vari variability in drying. Um, you know, we know as the temperature changes or the amount of flow we're having through the material, amount of drying time we have, have, we're going to get through varying amounts of drying, okay? Um, as we change the particle size, as things get bigger and bigger, the heat transfer through the material takes longer, such that our drying times take longer, okay? Different species have, have different pore sizes, drying times changes. As you move between natural and densified fuel, your drying times change. Densified fuel doesn't have all of the channels and pores, so it's, it's um, convective, Relationships are very different than a nat natural material. The heat transfer time through them changes. So that impacts how it performs in a thermal environment. Okay? So, depending on how you do this, you're going to end up with your drawing ending or, um, or still being in process in various points in the reactor. 
a poorly designed gas fire can end up with drying still happening in a chunk when the rest of the, the material is in combustion. You can now, again, have all of that stuff happening in the same chunk. You don't want that. You ideally want it totally done outside, have it be totally dry, and we have it be completely available for pyrolysis. Okay? Um, and to the degree to which you, know, you change the amount of moisture in it, that moisture is going to participate elsewhere in the system. Okay? So if you isolate drawing and you control the input in, into it, you can change, you can make sure it is totally dry or not dry. Um, you can deal with these different materials should you have them. You can deal with the, with the material breakdown of a densified material. Those are all potential things you can control or fail at control. Variability in pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is probably the biggest snake's nest in this thing. Pyrolysis produces this huge cocktail of hydrocarbons, but it's not consistent. Depending on the, the temperature of pyrolysis, the ramp rate, the duration, the, the types of tars you make vary highly. Um, they're typically divided into three main types, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary tars are literally fragments of the original biomass that broke off with heat. Okay? I see you. I'm going to stop. I'm almost done. Okay? So, primary tars. They are literal fragments of the biomass that when broken off could exist as a gas, separately. Okay? As they go to progressively higher temperatures, they start to recombine and they evolve into more complicated tars. The second type is called, uh, helpfully, secondary or secondary tars. Okay? As the temperature continues to increase, you get more recombination and evolution and it forms what are called tertiary tars or refractory tars. Those are characterized by having lots of double carbon bonds. They're very hard, um, tightly put together. They're very difficult to break back apart. So as your pyrolysis temperatures get higher and higher and your rate of doing pyrolysis gets faster, you make progressively more of these tertiary tar types. Those tar types are then much more difficult to crack downstream. So if we're running a biomass gas fire and we have this primary problem of cracking, one of the main ways to fix it is to not fix the, the hearth or try to fix it in the hearth with better geometry, but to alter pyrolysis so you don't make these tar types. So one of the significant things we do with the, the toddy architecture is we drive pyrolysis externally with the engine exhaust. We drive it over a very long period of time, over what's ultimately a, a lower temperature than it would be happening usually, and we try to optimize the making of these primary tar types. Mm -hmm. We try to prevent the creation of the tertiary tar types, thus the cracking later in the process is easier. And that's probably the main reason why we can run these small fuels, or relatively small fuels that have poor void space. Okay? So, in a regular downdraft gasifier, remember the pyrolysis is happening um, passively on top of the combustion zone. If you go and characterize that, you find out it happens in about a two inch band there. It happens ultimately at a very high temperature at a, in a very short period of time. It happens almost at combustion temperatures. So, the natural state of a downdraft gasifier is optimized to create these tertiary tars. It creates the worst type of tars to then deal with later in the system. Okay? So a core thing we've done is altered those pyrolysis dynamics so we don't make that tar type, and thus it's easier to deal with downstream, um, it's easier to crack them, and it also has a huge impact on your soot production. Okay? Um, so that's the tar side of pyrolysis. The charcoal side, depending on how you run pyrolysis, the charcoal that comes out of it also is highly variable. Um, and that has an impact once you get to the reduction stage. Um, if you run um, pyrolysis very quickly, like in a flash environment, it will start to graphene. It gets, it break, it, it doesn't develop its porosity as much as, as um, slow pyrolysis. The pyrolysis, the porosity gets better and better as it goes to a higher temperature, but if you do it too fast, I'm starting to understand here, it, it, it gives it this hard surface, okay? There's a lot of work that goes on this, and this, the, the characterization of char in pyrolysis is something that is still emerging and I'm still working through the details on. But, fortunately, the, the, the optimizing of the tar gas trends in the same way, um, condition-wise, as the optimization of the charcoal. 
if you run a slow pyrolysis regime to a relatively low temperature, you get this very reactive char that then makes your reduction work better two steps later. Okay? So that allows you to get a more full reduction, you get, um, you get more carbon, um, carbon monoxide and hydrogen produced, you get less um, unreacted gases passing through, um, unless you get a higher energy density gas and you get a cooler gas going out the end. So a whole variety of, of virtuous circles. So this, I consider the most variable process within, within a gasifier, and I actually spend a great deal of time trying to better control this, which is typically never talked about in gasifier design. But this is really the core of the problem. Okay? Variability of combustion. Well, we know what this is. Um, you know, depending on how much you've heated the air and the fuel coming in, you're going to achieve different top temperatures. Uh, you have issues about well mixing fuel and air, reaction time. The steam present will change combustion, uh, combustion reactions. At very high temperature, the steam's breaking and providing oxygen. It's a partial oxidating agent um, in combustion. The more you bring steam in and can support it, the less oxygen you're introducing through air, thus the less nitrogen dilution you get. So you want all that steam in there if possible. Um, char cracking, or lack thereof, is you know, temperature and resonance time. But in the other direction, you get it too hot, and if you're in the char bed, now you start slagging the minerals and forming glass. Too high a temperature, you get these gla glass forming in the bed. Okay? Um, and finally, in reduction, um, reduction is a relatively slow reaction in relation to combustion, so you need much more volume, much more reaction time to get it to complete. And to the degree that you do that, again, you have um, you have dilutant gases coming out at the end at a higher temperature. Okay? So you get you want to be mining the longest distance, the longest temperature range as possible. So for reduction, you want to start it at the highest possible temperature and mine all the way down to the lowest possible temperature. Okay? So um, designing such you get that high one and then enough volume such that you can go through the ends of these very slow parts of reduction is ideal. But the, the bigger you make that volume, typically the more bell packing and material handling problems you get into. So, from a chemical perspective, an infinitely large reduction zone would be perfect. Um, from a material handling perspective, it's very complicated to the point that, like, the fluidine reactors basically get rid of the reduction zone for material handling characteristics. So that that bell packing problem is just eliminated. But and which is you know, it has the great benefit of solving that, but it also produces a low energy um, gas and you don't finish the reduction. Okay, so I went through all that. So, those are, each of these processes of drying pyrolysis, combustion, and reduction um, have temperature issues, uh, top temp, ra ramp rate, they have other competing reactions that can be going on, and they have other reactants like steam that you're often dealing with. And by well controlling those and optimizing each of them, you can improve the whole operation system, you can prevent the tar issues, you can have higher tolerability to moist fuel, you can create higher energy density gas, um, and you can hopefully, ultimately, move closer to the Mr. Fusion, which we're all trying to make of this. Okay? So, that's the four rings. It's all clear now? By the end of this weekend, we can build one of those. That's what we're working on. Any questions?